The world of knowledge is amazing. Maybe that's the reason why in every corner of the world people have managed to discover wonderful things and so they have contributed a little more to the development of humanity. But how can we make sure that a discovery is scientifically right? What happens if we make a mistake? Well, fortunately, we have a tiny guide to discover the secrets of our universe in a direct and reliable way. The scientific method. Let's discover it together. First things first, how do we learn? An innocent question that hides thousands of conflicts. You see, since ancient times, some philosophers such as Plato believed that our own capacity to think should be enough to acquire knowledge. Disciplines such as mathematics might convince us of this, because they are representations of logic and with them we can describe pretty much everything, from the behavior of a black hole to the price of our food. This is what we call rationalism. Still, some people thought otherwise, like Aristotle, who embraced empiricism, the theory which proposes that knowledge is derived from our experience, what we perceive through our senses. David Hume argued that, for example, if we know that something will fall down when we drop it, it's because that's what we have always seen. We are so used to that result that we simply don't expect anything else to happen. What allows us to analyze the movement of the object is our experience with its repetition, because after all, we cannot predict the future, we can only expect things to happen the way they have happened before. It is hard to choose sides, isn't it? Nowadays we can say we need both, just as if experience were the material and reason the tool. Both tool and material are necessary to build after all. According to Karl Popper, reason can be used to handle knowledge and experience to verify whether it is applicable to the universe. Therefore, the method we are looking for should contain a little bit of both. Throughout history, a lot of people tried to build a complete scientific method. The first one is considered to be Ibn al-Haytham in the 11th century. However, his ideas were turned into the modern scientific method many years later during the 15th century, thanks to Francis Bacon, and it has been gradually enriched ever since. Now, let's explain how it works. As you may think, the process begins when someone observes a curious phenomenon and makes a question about it that still needs to be answered. By using all the previous knowledge on the topic, the researcher should develop a hypothesis, which is simply an educated guess of how the studied phenomenon should behave under specific circumstances. Thanks to it, it is possible to establish a cause and effect relationship which will have to be tested. Once the hypothesis is clear, we can move on to the experiment, which is creating a specific situation that enables us to check out and prove if our hypothesis was right. This is the empirical part of the process. Something really important to take into account is that the experiment has to be carried out a lot of times, because sometimes the statistics with few samples can lead to false assumptions. Once the experiment has concluded, we should analyze the results to determine whether they support the hypothesis or not. This is the rational part. But now, the fact that the hypothesis was confirmed by the results doesn't mean that it is 100% true but rather, it means that it is the most reliable explanation so far. If the results prove the hypothesis wrong, there is still some gain. We can eliminate the mistakes in our logic, develop a better hypothesis and start over again. That's the wonderful thing about this method. There's no way to lose, and thanks to it, we can improve our ideas as time goes by. After many scientists back up a hypothesis, it can be turned into a scientific theory or even a natural law. Now, according to Karl Popper, every scientific theory must be falsifiable, which means that it should be formulated in a way that it could be completely or partially refuted in case a new discovery proves it was wrong. For example, we cannot say that having a soul is falsifiable, because there is still no way to make an experiment that could test its existence or describe it. The reason why it is important for science to be falsifiable is that this is what allows it to move forward. You see, we can all agree that Newton's gravitational theory was very useful, but in the end it was refuted and modified by Einstein's general relativity, which is a little bit more precise. That is why science is like a handbook to understand our universe, a handbook that can be improved if we follow the scientific method. Of course, it isn't perfect or absolute. 
Some philosophers like Paul Feyerabend believe we shouldn't stay limited so strictly to one single method. Instead, we should stay open to a diversity of techniques. The truth is creativity and science are compatible as long as we take a critical and responsible position. As Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson once said, one of the great challenges in this world is knowing enough about a subject to think you're right, but not enough about the subject to know you're wrong. If you enjoyed the explanation we presented in this video, we invite you to discover some more of our content produced by Canic Time. In case there's any doubt, clarification or topic proposal, we remain at your service. Please feel free to leave your comments, like the video and subscribe.